jackknife sampling. That's exactly what I did. And what was the next step I did? I jackknife sampled it, and I took guesses. Was he an Indian, was he a Pakistani, was he an Asian? I applied different weights. Each of the guesses was a weight. Right? At my first instance, okay, let me, uh, I cannot, this is 1D data. It's just like the nationality, it's just 1D. So let me do, uh, use a 1D example. If, say, uh, his nationality, which is very ambiguous, is represented at this point in the uh, feature space, right? So if I had guessed it very correctly, an Indian Nepali, if I had guessed it very correctly, my reconstructed or my predicted uh, value would have been this, exactly this, right? That's not the point here. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay, just kidding. Uh, okay, so if I had correctly predicted it as Vietnamese of Indian origin, it would have come up here. But I guessed it as Indian. I asked the visible node here, which is, what's your name, sir? Sunil. Sunil. I asked Sunil if he was an Indian, right? I w what I was trying to do, I was trying to find the weight which was Vietnamese Indian. Let's assume this is Vietnamese Indian, right? Which I did not do. I chose different nationalities. And each time I chose a nationality, I kept coming back to the node to see, OK, have I guessed it correctly? I did not guess it correctly. So this is not my weight. Did I guess Pakistani correct? No. So this is not the weight. And at the moment, I guessed, OK, he is an Indian of dubious origins. Okay. This is somewhat right. And my distribution says, OK, you're somewhere here. right? If you translate it to a two-dimensional two data, and if I say, I have a particular distribution. This is my original distribution. And I'm trying to reconstruct the distribution. I'm trying to learn this distribution. right? So I subsample the feature out of a particular distribution, and I reconstruct it. I just use a random weight and I try to reconstruct. Of course, since I'm sitting in initial random seed, I'm not able to perfectly reconstruct this data. So at my first pass, my distribution is going to be something like this. It might not even be a normal distribution, but assuming that it's normal and all data distributions are assumed to be normal generally, let's assume we have this distribution as the initial uh, guess. So after this, unlike me, the Boltzmann's machine has visibility to the actual data. So it goes back to the original data, and it looks at the distribution. It looks at the difference between the distributions that were originally given to it and the distribution that it reconstructed. So this is what is called as scale divergence, which is uh, callback labeler divergence, which is basically a measure of difference between two uh, distributions. OK? So keeps reiterating. So now the KL divergence is very high. right? It's greater than a particular uh, convergence limit you give it. So it sets a random seed again. At this random seed, it gets closer and closer and closer. right? At a particular point, the KL limit becomes so small that it says, OK, fine, I have converged now according to a user set limit. Let me choose this particular weight for this particular sampled feature. So my Boltzmann's machine has chosen this weight for resampling and reconstructing the nationality of Sobraj, right? or any two-dimensional data. So that is for one sample. Just assume that this is being done for multiple samples. Your data, is consist, your data consists of hundreds of features. It takes several samples, subsamples of it, a jackknife sampling, and it reconstructs it and it tries reconstructing the entire data through this process. And finally, it ends up reconstructing the original data. I mean, it ends up reconstructing the actual data as well as it can. So what is the advantage of whatever was done right now? We didn't have to feed any labels to the data, right? The data learned itself. It was a self-learning algorithm. Of course, it was not self-learning in the traditional sense. It's self-learning in the form of a neural network. What is a neural network do? It mimics the human mind, right? 
So this is exactly what a human mind would do. You take a book, you read, okay, the capital of India is, I don't know the answer. When I was a kid, I had to see, okay, the capital of India is Delhi. I had to see it, right? Once I know it, I know it. So now the machine has learned it. It has looked at the source, a reliable source, which is the actual data you give it, and it learns from the source. And it has the ground truth, and it finds the weights. So it knows for my actual data that has been provided, there are particular weights that will reconstruct this data properly, right? So it has reconstructed it. So what can be done with this? You have weights now, and you have reconstructed the data. What more can be done with this? So we are talking about recommender systems. How do we apply this to a recommender system? So uh, how many of you are aware of uh, PCA, principal component analysis? Quite a few. Wow, that's nice. Uh, so I don't need to write anything then. So uh, what does a principal component analysis do? Can anyone just um, brief it up? Right. Right. So it's basically a dimensionality reduction method, right? So once I reduce the dimensions in a PCA-based method, I would be able to reconstruct the original matrix back, right? So let's assume I have a five cross five matrix. I don't know how many I'll be able to run this. Three, four, five. Okay. Okay. Now let's say I. Uh, have filled up this matrix, right? Assume this is just a five cross five for an example. Assume this is like a matrix of millions of rows and columns. And uh, the matrix is very sparse. And I want to reduce the, I want to try reconstructing this matrix using PCA. So when I reconstruct the matrix, would these missing values be filled when I do a PCA reconstruction? Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this a particular matrix, and then try to reconstruct the matrix. Would I be able to fill these missing values? Yes, right? Yeah, just a guess. It's not an interview question. <laughs> just a guess. Yeah? OK, I'll give you the answer. Yes, it can be. So uh, if I'm reconstructing this matrix, and I'm filling in the values here, what am I doing? Am I not doing a very rudimentary form of imputation here? How faithful is the reconstruction? Nobody knows, because it's uh, on sparse data, it, you cannot say how accurate it can be. So apply the same to a Boltzmann's machine, right? A Boltzmann's machine tries to reconstruct the same data, right? It takes the distribution of this matrix, and it tries to learn the matrix's structure, and it reconstructs it, as simple as that. So that's, that's the way you get the weights in a Boltzmann's machine, right? So how do you go about after getting the weights? So the most popular form of using the weights in a Boltzmann's machine is using it as an input to a normal neural network. A Boltzmann's machine is a bipartite uh, unidirectional graph, right? You have You have uh, the directions here, right, which are going back and forth, right? So it's going to be computationally very intensive. So what people usually do is use the structure to get the weights of the uh, data that you can feed into a neural network. So once you get the weights, you get uh, you can feed it into a neural network and get a faithful reconstruction of um, a sparse matrix. And what is a sparse matrix? When you fill up a sparse matrix, that basically becomes your recommender system, right? And this recommender system can be so powerful, it can be as good or even better than a human performer. I'll give you an example of what a really good recommender system can be like. Uh, my colleague, Abhi, Abhimanyu, he gave an example of what a bad recommender system can be. Like, he has been recommending, getting recommended uh, for Oakley glasses for two years. But there was this uh, supermarket chain in the US I don't know if I can take their name. They were sued by a father uh, because he was getting 
too many advertisements in his mailbox uh, which sold pregnancy products, right? So they were, the supermarket chain was sending advertisements saying, we suspect that someone at your home is pregnant. Buy this thing, buy this product, buy this baby product, blah, 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 whatever. So this father got very angry because he had a teenage daughter, 15 or 16 years old daughter, and uh, he was very angry that how dare these guys keep sending this to me day in and day out, and he sued them. And uh, three or four months later, it turns out that the girl was indeed pregnant. They had been tracking their uh, purchasing behavior, buying pattern in the supermarket, and they realized, or rather they used some intelligent algorithm to guess that this girl is indeed pregnant, right? So they have been sending her pregnancy uh, product recommendations, for lack of a better word. So uh, yeah, that's how powerful a good recommender uh, system can be. I didn't want to name the client. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So, um, these are uh, the slides which I just explained. Uh, if you have any technical questions, you can uh, always catch me offline. And uh, <clears throat> that was about restricted Boltzmann's machines. And uh, for a wrap up, let's just ask another. Uh, question, a very quick question. How many of you know why a Boltzmann's machine is called a restricted Boltzmann's machine? A Boltzmann's machine is something which takes feedback and uh, reconstructs data faithfully. But uh, why is it called a restricted Boltzmann's machine? What's restricted in it? Sorry? The number of dimensions. Uh, no, it's not got to do with the number of dimensions. It's uh, hint is it's got to do with the structure of the graph. 